Hello, and welcome to the Knife and Fork Show. I'm Jason Huffman, the Editor-in-Chief of Food Chemical News, that's this publication. I've heard it said that staying on top of food regulation is like drinking water out of a fire hose. Seems like that is what we are doing every week at Food Chemical News. Uh, there are more than 20 federal agencies that have a direct or indirect influence on the way food is regulated, and that doesn't count Congress, the state agencies, consumer advocacy groups, international authorities, social media, on and on, all of these different forces that can sometimes influence this topic. Fortunately, our offices are right on the Metro Line into Washington, D.C., and we've got loads of experience. In fact, my most experienced staff member joins us here today. Senior Editor Steve Clapp has been covering food policy for more than 40 years. Steve gets into all kinds of issues for us on Food Chemical News, including international food regulation, codex, packaging, labeling. But the issue where he has been spending most of his time recently is on biotechnology. Before we get into what's happening right now, let's give our audience a quick 101 on what biotechnology means and what it is. Well, biotechnology covers a, a very wide swath of activity. Um, a lot of it is in the drug area, and uh, the, the public seems to have no problem with that at all. If, bi if biotechnology is going to save your life, uh, you're thank very thankful for it. But agricultural biotechnology has uh, been controversial over the years. Um, it's a matter of splicing genes from uh, one species of plant into another, usually, and, and uh, even uh, splicing genes into um, animals. And um, the most common uh, gene splicing involves uh, helping to make our corn and other plants resistant to insects so that the insects don't destroy the, the uh, crops. And another common use is splicing uh, gene into, uh, for example, soybeans so that you can spray them with the herbicide Roundup and uh, you kill the weeds but you don't kill the plant because it's been engineered to uh, be tolerant to the herbicide. Um, in Europe, they call these GMOs, genetically modified organisms. Um, to the industry and the regulators in this country, that's like uh, freedom fries or, or uh, you know, it's one <laughs> of these words that you, or terms that you don't use because um, genetically modified organisms sound scary. Um, and it, and it, it implies that, that the, these things are alive. Well, at some point they are alive when they're growing, but, but when you eat a potato chip, you're not eating a, a live organism, you're, you're eating right. a processed food. So the angst has been building around genetically enhanced food for some time. It seems to have reached an alt new peak recently. Um, and there was a big national convention in Boston uh, just recently that you attended um, where the biotech industry was you know, basically arrived in force, something like, what, 16,000 people? 16,000 people, yeah. Um, I know that they went through in your article in the publication, you talked about a number of issues that they were uh, expressing anxiety about and issues they were trying to deal with. What was the hottest issue in your mind that they were talking about at the conference? Well, I would say, I would say um, that the ag biotech industry was more on the defensive than I've ever seen it in previous years. Usually it's, uh, gee whiz, we're doing this, gee whiz, we're doing that, and uh, aren't, isn't it all rosy? But um, they had sessions on coexistence with uh, organic foods. They had a-, a Which the, it, it, it sounds like a friendly term, but actually <laughs> for uh, the biotech industry, it's, um, them's are fighting words, right? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, um, Secretary Vilsack, um, formed a committee, an advisory committee, uh, to help him uh, deal with this issue of how biotech and organic can get along, and he gave him a very specific charge. He said, I want you to come up with a compensation mechanism to uh, uh, help out farmers who've been, uh, whose crops have been commingled with the biotech crops. And um, fortunately, for the biotech industry anyway, he left in a tiny little phrase saying, um, we want you to solve this, uh, uh, this problem, if any, uh, which is the, the loophole that allows the industry to say, we don't think there's a problem. Show us the data. Mm. And um, that's, that's one of the issues. 
but there was also a session on uh, how to cope with lawsuits, um, a session on how do you build consumer trust. Um, the, the, the biotech industry, the ag biotech industry, definitely feels like it's uh, somehow losing the hearts and minds to uh, um, the organic people and the other non-biotech non people. And they, they're really puzzled as to how to uh, turn this ship around. Right. Now, we're running short of time, but I did want to ask you about one other thing that's going on in the, uh, the biotech area that I think is um, getting a lot of attention. And that is in California, uh, there is currently an effort afoot to require food be labeled when it contains GM parts, correct? Well, the, the, um, the consumer advocacy groups and the environmental groups, I think, saw an opening uh, a, with the Obama administration, and uh, B, with the uh, advent of uh, genetically engineered salmon. And they started saying consumers have a right to know if their food has been produced by genetic engineering. Um, and in California, they, uh, as you know, they, they have something called Proposition 65. They have a process whereby if, you, if citizens get, gather enough signatures on a petition, they can get something on the ballot in California, whether it has to do with real estate taxes, or in this case, whether it has to do with labeling foods. And they gathered more than a half a million signatures, uh, cl actually close to a million by their count. And um, this issue is going to be on the ballot in November. Uh, they're uh, major groups here, including the Grocery Manufacturers Association, the Biotechnology Industry Associate, uh, Organization, obviously, um, and they're they're uh, at loggerheads, and um, it's uh, it's going to be a major fight. But if if the uh, proposition is approved by the voters, and it only takes a majority, um, then it becomes California law. And if it becomes California law, then the question for the food industry is, what do we do? Do we just, do we label only the products that we're selling in California? Or do we just label all of them um, uh, that we sell in the United States? And, uh, and maybe label the exports that we, we send to Europe and Asia and the, all the other you places? Know, one thing of note, I think, is uh, that I've heard recently, and I, I should probably check and make sure this is true, but... Um, I understand that California is the seventh largest market, not in the country, but in the world. Um, so yeah. it's a fair amount of consumers in California that, uh, you know, they would be labeling products for. Yeah, it's, it's like the 800-pound gorilla. And so if, if GM labeling happens in California, it, it will have a big impact. Now, um, in theory, uh, the Food and Drug Administration could say, hey, you're preempting our labeling policy, uh, and if you do that, we're going to sue you. But thus far, um, nobody at FDA, either publicly or privately, said that that's going to happen. Thus far. Thus far. Yeah, yeah. That's a good cliffhanger to end on. <laughs> so we're out of time again. Thanks for joining us, Steve. We'll be back soon with another interview. If you have trouble finding us, just go to www.foodchemicalnews.com. Mm -hmm.